morning. Welcome to Wednesday's service. It's great to, that we can do this, even if it is by technology when you can't join together, but it is great. Let us have a time of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for what all that we are learning and we thank you for who you are, our gracious God. We thank you, Father, for our families and our friends. And we pray, Father, that each of them will know that you love them and bless them. And we pray, Father, that as we listen to this service this morning, that you will teach us what you want us to know and you'll encourage us to go out and be obedient to you. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I now call on Bill to come and give the reading. Thank you. Good morning. Our reading today, is, uh, this morning, is from the New Testament and we're reading about uh, the parable of the sower from Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 to 23. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered round him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came to, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, The knowledge of the secrets of kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will ever be hearing, but never understanding. You will ever be seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is a man who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty or thirty times what we're sowing. This is the word of the Lord. I'll now call on Johnson to come and give his message. Good morning, church. We want to thank God for allowing us and giving us this opportunity to listen to the word of God in our own homes. 
I do want to, to welcome you for our midweek service. Today is Wednesday, and we want to thank God for allowing us to uh, hear the word of God and read the word of God and soak ourselves in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that all gifts come from you. We thank you for all you have given us. And as the good soil welcomes the seed and causes it to grow, we welcome you to take root and flourish in our lives. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us um, come to the theme of today. Our today's theme uh, is marinating in the spirit. Marinating in the spirit, which is really something maybe you need to think about it. When you are cooking, some people marinate their meat and they put it uh, in the fridge for some hours so that the marinade really goes in deep into the meat. Marinating in the spirit. What soil does your spirit soak in? How do you nourish and ensure that your spirit is secure, peaceful, confident and satisfied? In today's day and age, your answer might probably be a default to physical or emotional wellness. Exercise each day, eat a good diet, do yoga, meditate in nature, accumulate sufficient wealth. Attain job security, foster good relationship and reject toxic people. Take a bubble bath, buy yourself something nice, take a trip, do something you love to do. I'm sure you have heard those, these solutions and more for feeling down in the dumps or in need of a lift or maybe feel better about losing some weight. But these are limited fixes. While they all may help gain specific goals and contribute to happiness, they don't get to the bottom of what drives the human spirit. Nor do they solve what harms the human soul. While you may sculpt your body into top physical condition or foster emotional wellness, most people today ignore spiritual wellness, the kind of confidence, stability, constants, enrichment, and quality of life that only comes from faith and relationship with God. Some say may maybe nonsense, you say. If that's your response, you are one of men who believe that in today's culture, everything can be solved by rational and practical means. However, to that argument, actual studies show that those who put their faith in higher power for Christians, that means faith in Jesus, are happier, more content in their lives, more consistent and stable, and more likely to weather the storms of life without capsizing their boat. While many may mistrust organized religion or denominational systems, more and more people are realizing that relying on the Holy Spirit can change their lives for better. But in order to allow the Spirit to come into your life and to change your life's course, you need to be open to change, ready for change, willing and able to commit to the discipleship process. Today we don't talk much about discipleship. It's a kind of old-fashioned word for us. And we don't quite understand what it means. But in today's scripture, Jesus explains that process in a sermon he gave in Capernaum as a crowd gathered at the river's edge. Because Jesus was speaking to farmers and laborers, he used a series of agricultural metaphors to explain how to attain a satisfied and fruitful life. One that not only soothes and troubles all, but nurtures others in the process. Jesus explains what it takes to be a true disciple by telling us what attempts on our part will fail. He then explains what the metaphors mean. Let's look at what he says. Jesus describes the word of God, that is our potential spiritual wellness in relation with God, as seeds. For wellness of spirit with the seeding of God's presence, power, and spirit breath for life within us. So God's spirit within us has the potential to change and mold us and grow us and flourish within us when we recognize it, cherish it, and nourish it, and allow it to take root in our spirits. We become one with God and God with us. But God can only offer us this gift of life, truly receive an enriched life. We must respond in other, in certain ways. This is what Jesus explains to us. Jesus describes first three ways that God's spirit cannot change, change us. If the seed falls upon the path and bathes it, that was number one. 
Number two, if the seed falls on shallow rocky ground and the spalling becomes scorched by the sun and withers without roots to receive constant water. Number three, if the seed falls among other seeds of weeds and thorns and becomes choked out by other stronger, more urgent uh, competitors. Number four, only the seed that falls upon good soil will take root, grow, bear, and nourish others. So the seed on the path, he says, when people hear God's message about the kingdom of God, but don't understand it, therefore the message simply fades away. What Jesus is saying is that no connection, no true connection was made between God's word and the human heart. So it never attached itself to mind, heart, or spirit. We may listen to a sermon, we may read the scriptures, but we aren't really paying attention. We may be daydreaming or we may be scheming to get through or we may be distracted, but for whatever person, whatever reason, although we have read with our eyes, the meaning never connected with our hearts. So anyone listening ever has something on your mind, you end up reading the same page of book four or five times. You read it with your eyes, but your mind didn't kick it. That's what Jesus says when it happens to a lot of us each day, every time we hear the scriptures. We hear God's message with our ears, but it doesn't sink in. How many times have we heard this passage of Matthew 13 about the parable of the sin? So many times, maybe over a hundred times, but it doesn't even sink in. It doesn't sink in, it can't take root. Simply as that, as we might say in internet language, no connection. Or in the midst of talking, connection lost. You can see reconnecting, try to reconnecting on the phone. And connection is the right word, I think, for what Jesus is explaining to us. Because when a seed hits soil, there is something amazing, something amazing that happens, a kind of miraculous germination. That's what is like also when we enter into relationship. A relationship changes both people within it. Anyone who has entered in any relationship, you'll be changed. Whether it's for a month, whether it's for two months, whether it's for one year, whether, you'll be changed if you enter into a relationship. Maybe do you, do you know that you don't have any relationship in your life that doesn't change your life. Likewise, you have in some way changed every person you have been in relationship with. A relationship with God will change you. If you allow yourself to engage in it, God will change you. So, what's the second description Jesus gives? He describes a seed on a rocky ground, saying that this refers to people who hear the word immediately and receive it with joyful, but because they have no roots, their joy only lasts for a little while. Because they don't take roots into understanding what God is saying. As soon as they experience distress in their lives or someone gives them a hard time because they are Christian or believe in God, they immediately retract their beliefs and fall in with the common crowd. They renounce their faith. There are people when they face challenges, they renounce their faith. Right now I know of people who have renounced their faith, faith because of the COVID-19. They've renounced their faith. Where is God? They're asking now. Their faith falls away because it never took root in their hearts at all. It was a superficial joy, rational, and deeply seated faith. This is the description of the weekly Christian. This is the story of today's church. Those whose discipleship consists of a weekly 45 minutes feel good boost. We feel elated, holy, and good about ourselves, refreshed when you go to church. What was said inspired us, or the music lifted us up for that moment. But when we walk out of the door, all we learn dis disperse like rain in the wind, especially when life gets tough. When things go wrong, faith is nowhere to be found. Because we never really want entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We only took what he had to say and thought it sounded inspirational to our lives. And it doesn't sink into our lives. It doesn't help us to go on. That's like valuing the beauty, the poem, the circumstances of a wedding. But when getting down to everyday life, living with someone in rough and tumble relationship, things fall. I've seen weddings, people wedding with, you think these are the best people in, who will be the best waiters in the world. But three months down the line, they're now seeking for divorce. What has happened? 
What is it that is changing their lives? When the commitment and love is not there, when the heart is not connected on a deep level, when too much depends on superficial idea of a wedding and a marriage, rather than on the commitment of heart to another person, there are no roots. So relationships are built upon trust, commitment, and on open heart. So is our relationship with God. We trust God. We, are, we have committed our lives to God and will not change even in this uh, event of facing hardships, challenges. But Jesus says it, a third warning. He tells about the seed that falls upon thorns, competing foliage. He explains that these are those who hear God's word, but the worries of life and the false appeal of wealth and glitz choke God from our lives so that our spirits can bear no fruit. Yes, we want to worship God. But we want to worship God. It's only more of the material things. Not on the spiritual side. So the glit of gold and more trend and attractive fixes to our life's problems and pain to us and compete for our loyalties. And if they win, our faith is left behind. Relegated to a corner like a toy without a battery. We are no longer going to use God. That's why I find a lot of people, they, when they come to church, they want to know how can they become wealthy? How can they attain, how can they be blessed in their Christian journey? I'm not talking that being blessed is, is, is not wrong, is not good. It's good. But that is not the thing that we seek. We seek God. We begin to believe that quick fixes can solve all of our problems. That can doesn't after we have the power to give us what we need. This is a failure to our faith. In a nation, this is an adultery, an attraction to an image, not to a reality. Only the seed, Jesus tells, that falls upon the good soil will germinate God's spirit within it. Sprout and grow, bear fruit, and enrich others with its feast of love and kindness. So only this kind of soil will nurture a spirit in the way that provides a steady, consistent, stable, and joyful life. A peaceful soul that can persevere through any storm or gale. So how do we cultivate this kind of relation with God? What does it take for true discipleship? Jesus gives us that the answer in his description of what will not work. And this is not any different from that might work for you in any of your other relationships. One, spend time and truly make a connection with God. Open your heart and allow yourself to trust and love deeply. Commit to the long haul and don't forget distracted by what seems greater, greener in the other yard. That's why I find that people, they are not contented with what they have. They always want to see the greener grass in the other pasture, not where they are. So we, we need to be contented, we need to see, we need to be connected, we need to trust and commit ourselves. The three staples of any relationship are the same for any discipleship foundation. If any of you are cooks, you know the difference between a microwave packed meal and a gourmet feast made from scratch. The first is super fast, quick and easy. If you microwave your food, it's quick and easy. Some are 10 minutes, some are 15 minutes, 20 minutes, you now have your supper. The second takes time, effort, love and commitment, some marination and some creative flavor. But the result is superb feast. You enjoy the meal, it can take one hour, two hours to cook, to prepare your meal. But it's the best, not the microwave one. So that's the kind of feast Jesus offers us in the kingdom of God. An unforgettable feast for our weary souls and never-ending signs of peace and joy. So th this week, and always, I challenge you to take a look at your discipleship, your faith, and your life. Prepare your hearts to receive the gift of the Spirit. Spend time during the week in scripture, prayer, and connect yourself with God. Be connected to God. Don't stay where there is no internet. <laughs> Don't stay where there is no internet. Be connected. Be connected with God. Open your heart and accept Jesus into your life and trust him deeply. Commit to him with your whole heart for the long haul. And don't let the worries of life or the promises of quick fix distract you from the promise of the kingdom of God. Don't jump for those things. Don't jump for those things. Those quick fix, no. Say no. Dip yourself. Dip yourself in the word of God. Trust God for your commitment. Ask, pray to God. 
May God bless you in your endeavors, in your relationship, and in your life as you choose to follow him as a disciple of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was telling this parable to his disciples, he was trying to make them understand who they are in the world and what they must do. So for you to achieve the best in life, stay connected to Jesus Christ. Don't choose the other way. Don't choose the other way. Stay connected. May the good Lord bless you from now and evermore. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, restrain our thoughts so that they do not wander amid the vanities of this world. Grant that we may be united to the affection of your love. And worthy though we be, glory be to God. Ascend into the chamber of your reward light. So in, the, so in me, so in every one of us, the seed of humility under the wings of your grace, hide us through your mess. If we were to mark iniquities, O oh Lord, we shall stand. Because there is mercy with you. Help us, Lord, to understand who you are. Help us to understand this parable, this new teaching. And we need to abide and connect ourselves to Jesus Christ. Father, help us. Where there are so many sounds, where there are so many connections calling us to connect to them. Father, help us, Lord. Be with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May we receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Holy Spirit. 